All right, well, good morning. It's good to see you here today. You know, I really appreciate our worship team and just what they do on a weekly basis. They really sacrifice and work hard. Uh, and I, they appreciate that. Um, but especially today, we had a couple of folks call in sick. There's just a lot of sickness going on these days. And, and uh, so at the last minute, that's tough on a worship team, but they're just so adaptable and flexible. They got here early and they worked it out and, and uh, do a great job. So I just, I really appreciate the effort that they give in that way. That was good to see you here this morning. Did you survive Snowmageddon? Man, the snowpocalypse, how we did that. You know, all those flakes that fell here and the, the horrifying moment that was. And, you know, I'm glad you plowed your way in today. It was really good. But, uh, yeah, it's so funny when we have that kind of weather here in, in the south, you know, and we, everybody goes and they get their bread and their milk and we make milk sandwiches and so wonderful because that's apparently what you do. And, and uh, if you're from the north and you've been here long enough and you just watched this happen this week, you've got to be like, oh, my gosh, what is wrong with these people? A few flakes fall and everybody's just messed up. Anyway, we're here. It's good. Uh, if you're new today, first of all, we're glad that you are here, but uh, let me kind of catch you up on what we've been talking about. We're in a message series called Simplify, and uh, <clears throat> we're just talking about the whole issue of uncluttering our souls. And you know, souls sometimes are like closets in our house or our apartment where we just keep putting things, you know, we don't know what to do with it, and we put it in there, or, you know, the stuff that we have just keeps growing, and we need to put it in this closet, just gets full of stuff, but every now and again, we have to go in, and we have to take some stuff out, we have to reorder some things, right, and so, uh, in a way, that's what we're trying to do here, is just take a look at what's inside, and say, do we need some better priorities, do we need to be focusing on something different, maybe, maybe our focus has shifted in our life, and, and we need to get that back in order, so, that's kind of what we're doing, just talking about how we can do that well, because the results of this are two things that I think everybody really wants in their life. We want peace, don't we? And we want freedom. We want to see genuine peace and genuine freedom in our life. We don't want to be bound to anything. We don't want to be ruled by anxiety and worry. And you know what? Jesus doesn't want that either. And the Bible very clearly talks about the fact that, that God wants us to be free from those things. And uh, some of the things that we're talking about are things that can, that can cause trouble in our life. So we want to be free from that. So last week, <clears throat> we talked about our schedule and making sure that we give our schedule first to God. Because, you know, our schedule is shaping us to be someone, right? It's shaping us up to be some kind of a person whether that's good, whether that's not good, whatever it is, but how we live our life and the, the things that we do with our time are shaping us into somebody. So we want to be sure they're shaping us into the people that God wants us to be. So that's what we talked about last week. This morning, we're going to tackle another issue that can be such a struggle for people in their life, and that's just the issue of our finances, our money, and, and, and learning how to be free with that. Now, over 20 years of ministry, I've had a lot of people come to my office and talk about a lot of issues in their life, but it's amazing to me how many times somebody comes to my office and they present with one issue, but somehow it, it's all related to the issue of money. Uh, money is a, is a source of a lot of struggle for people. And I wrote down some phrases that, that I've heard over the years when it comes to money. First of all, I'm overwhelmed. Have you ever just felt overwhelmed because of your finances? Usually that has to do with debt. Uh, we, we owe a lot of people and we're not sure how to work that out. So, or how about I'm broke? <laughs> Have you ever just got to play with I'm just like, I'm broke. I got nothing. Um, I'm scared. Maybe you've gotten into a situation where letters are coming in the mail. People are calling. You're just thinking Guido's showing up tomorrow morning, and that's going to be the end of this deal. You know, if I don't pay up, but I can't pay, I'm scared. Or I worry about money all the time. I've heard that. I can't seem to not worry about money. Or I'm afraid I might lose it all. I've heard people who have a lot of money who during different times, uh, you know, recessions or stock market and craziness, I'm afraid I'm going to lose what I have. I'm afraid I'm going to make a mistake and then we're not going to have anything and I'm, I'm leveraged out and that would be bad. I dream about having a lot of money. Ever done that? We'll talk about that in a minute. I never seem to have enough money. Yeah, that's a common problem. At the end of every month, I'm still paying bills. You know, I'm still paying somebody else and there's never enough to go around. So those are just a few phrases. You could add your own phrase to that list, I'm sure, of ways that money uh, has been a tough uh, place for you. Now, maybe money has been great joy for you, and you found freedom in that, and that is a blessing, and that's something you own as well. 
Um, but there's one question that I want to offer today, just to kind of help us get focused on making sure that we're moving in the right direction with this. It's just this one question of how much money does it take to make you happy? How much money does it take to be happy? You know, that is a question that I think we need to get around pretty quickly to understand what we feel in our philosophy and theology about our money. How much money does it take for me to be genuinely happy in my life? You know, what does it take to be provided for? And, and who do I believe is the source of all that? And so um, that's something we want to deal with. Now, um, recently, this little thing happened called the Powerball. You heard of that? $1.5 billion. That was ridiculous. And, you know, um, I, I could just, I mean, you could just feel the dreaming going on in this country about the Powerball. Maybe you bought a ticket or two or went into a pool with a whole bunch of other people and bought tickets. I don't know. Becky and I jokingly talked about buying tickets, but we didn't. We're not doing that. Anyway. So uh, a lot of people dreaming about what in the world, you know, it's, you don't get 1.5 billion, right? You only get about half a billion. Oh, it's just like, well, you can't do anything with half a billion. If you don't have the 1 billion, you're really not having all of it. You know, I mean, it's just dreams are squashed. No, 500, half a million, billion, 500 million. I mean, that'll take you somewhere, you know? And a lot of people are like, man, what am I going to do with all that guacamole? <laughs> And what was so funny is all the people who said, I'm going to give all my closest friends $10,000 if I win that. And on Facebook, if you'll reshare this, I'll give you $1,000. How many of you? No, we're not going to ask that. But, you know, all these big ideas about what we're going to do with this money and dreaming about, man, if I just had that money, I'm going to buy this, I'm going to do that. It's kind of like if you're a country music fan, Chris Jansen has a song called Buy Me a Boat. Do you know this song? You love that song. Uh, I said I wasn't going to sing this song. But it sort of goes like this. I ain't rich, but I dang sure want to be. Working like a dog all day ain't working for me. I wish I had a rich uncle like Warren Buffett that had kicked the bucket. And I was sitting on a pile. I know everybody says money can't buy happiness. But it could... Buy me a boat. It could buy me a truck to pull it. It could buy me a Yeti 110 eyes down with some juice boxes in it. They never let me on this mic. Today's the day, Scott. This guy's going. <laughs> yes, you could buy a boat with a billion dollars. <clears throat> you could buy a lot of things with uh, all that money, for sure. And, and that song is just so funny about, you know, it's like all this money, but I'm just going to buy me a boat. I'm going to buy me a rod and reel. Yeti. You know, what, what, what do you do with that kind of money? Well, you know, it's, it's money is one of those things that's so tied to our heart, isn't it? You know, what we desire in our heart is is, you know, the, the thing, you know, is this like, what are we going to do with the stuff in our life? And, and, you know, it matters to God what we do with the things that we have in this life. And it matters how we view what we have. And so this morning, we're going to talk about that. And we're going to start with this guy in the Bible who had a whole lot of money. But in having that, he uh, did not find a source of fulfillment and contentment and joy that, that he uh, wanted in his life. And so if you have your Bible, it's going to be in Luke 19, uh, 1 through 10. Luke 19, verses 1 through 10. Um, this is a, uh, an event that you are very well aware of, I'm quite sure, if you've ever read the Bible or whatever. Um, if you grew up in Sunday school and church, you sang a song about this wee man. <laughs> His name is what? Zacchaeus, right. Zacchaeus was a very wealthy man who came about his money by some unsavory means, and, and uh, in doing that, he uh, uh, found not the joy and hope that he wanted, and he had to find it somewhere else, and then Jesus enters the picture. So let's read about this, and then we'll talk about it on the other side, starting in verse 1 there. Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and he climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. 
When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and he said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and he welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter. Complain, gossip, put a word in there. He has gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and he said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half my possessions to the poor. And if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount. And Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham, for the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. This story is one of those that's so vital in the gospel to helping us understand a couple of things. And there's, there's really two main ideas out of this. The first one is the most obvious. This, this whole idea that Jesus would go to a guy who was really an outcast in his society, and we'll talk more about that in a minute, who was at the margin and, and who uh, everybody knew this guy was a straight up sinner because of the way he treated people in his life, go to him out of all the people and say, Zacchaeus, I see you. I see you. I know you. You don't know me yet, but I know you. And today, and he says in front of all these people, I'm coming to your house and we're going to eat a meal together. And in that day, eating a meal together signified friendship. It was an intimate thing that people did. It was, it was important relationally. And so he said, Zacchaeus, today we're going to be friends. And everybody around him just went, oh my gosh, what is Jesus doing? Eating with sinners, you know. And it was, it, they just couldn't understand this, but this is the heart of God. And so he goes to Zacchaeus, and Zacchaeus, man, when he got down out of the tree, it says he welcomed him gladly because there was something going on with Zacchaeus. There was something wrong. And so Jesus goes to his house. I wish we had the conversation, but we don't. But some really good conversation went in there in such a way that Jesus was able to show Zacchaeus there is a new way to live your life, and you can be free. You can have peace. And that must have sounded really good to Zacchaeus, and he accepted that, and salvation came to his house that day. A beautiful, beautiful story of God's love and his grace and his mercy. But you know, what's also interesting is the second thing is, it was tied up in this whole issue of his money and his finances and what he valued in life. So let me kind of set the scene of what's happening in the scripture, and we'll get into that in just a little bit more detail. So Jesus, it says, is going through Jericho. And here's what's happening. He's on his way to Jerusalem because it's Holy Week. And, and uh, thousands of people are on a trek uh, to Jerusalem uh, for Holy Week. Now, also, it was the time when people would pay their taxes. And uh, Jerusalem was in a territory that was controlled by Rome. And, um, and so people had to come every year and pay their taxes. Jericho was an outpost, uh, a place where taxes were received. And so a lot of people in that region went to Jericho to pay their taxes before they went to Jerusalem. Okay, so um, this guy, Zacchaeus, lives in the town of Jericho, but he's there because of his job. And here's the thing, Zacchaeus is a Jew. But at some point, he went to work for the Roman government, the pagan Roman government. And uh, he did so well at his job of, of uh, receiving taxes and actually extorting the people, which we'll get into in a second, but he did such a good job, they made him chief tax collector. So he was over a division of other collectors who would actually sit at the table and collect the money. He was in charge of all of them. But here's the deal. Somewhere along the way, he struck a deal with the Roman government. And he said, hey, listen, if I can get more than the tax out of these people, will you pay me? And they said uh, somewhere along the way, they probably gave him a couple of options. They said, okay, whatever you get above and beyond the required tax, you just stick it in your pocket or we'll pay you more. Either way, he learned how to extort his own people. And you can imagine that, you know, there were folks coming to that table having to pay their taxes that he was trying to get more out of, people like widows who didn't have much money, young couples with new baby, elderly people. You know, it, it didn't matter to him. It didn't matter to the tax collectors. They were greedy. They were mean. And they expected you to pay up exactly what they were asking you to pay. How many times that people must have broken down right in front of him at that table? How many poor widows just cried as they put their last coin in the plate for him? And I just suspect, and biblical scholars would say, that over time, it's possible that at some point, Zacchaeus grew a heart. 
And that in the process of doing that, he began to have compassion for his own people and he began to feel extremely guilty for what he was doing. And not only that, but we can surmise that Zacchaeus was not married, he didn't have children, and he didn't have many friends, and the friends that he did have were also snakes like him. And so they didn't trust each other, so he didn't have any true friendships. So he was lonely. So here you go, a guilt-ridden, broken, lonely person who, by the way, is probably the wealthiest person in town, huge house, could have everything he wanted materially, but at some point had, had discovered he really had nothing. And that's how we can surmise why he would even go looking for Jesus. And he knew that Jesus was coming through Jericho, and probably he had heard that this guy was a healer, that he was bringing hope to people. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus could actually get him out of this somehow. Maybe Jesus could, could get him out of this lifestyle, and he could find some hope for his life and, and have a new life. You know, that's what he was probably believing in. So he goes there, he's in the crowd, you know, he's a short guy, vertically challenged, trying to figure out a way, I need to see him, you know, I need to see him. Maybe, maybe if I can see him, he might even see me. So he gets up into that sycamore tree, and you know, that was kind of an unmanly, undignified act in itself. You have to pull up your robe, and you have to climb this tree, and any shred of a reputation he had left was gone right then, as everybody watched him do that. And so he gets up in there, and, and as we read, Jesus saw Zacchaeus and went and ate with him. And Zacchaeus' heart was opened up as a result of this, and he really did find new life. And, and Jesus presented this new life to him. And, and it's interesting to me the result that we have recorded in Scripture of what happened in his heart was that he went straight to his money. And it says that he gave half his possessions to the poor, which would have been a bunch, and he said, if I've cheated anybody out of anything, I will pay back four times the amount, which was way beyond the Jewish requirement of paying a penance to somebody else. And he was trying in the best way that he knew how with his new faith to, to show practically what he felt in his heart spiritually by saying, you know what, this money has been nothing but a burden to me. This has been nothing but a source of frustration for me. So today, I'm going to do something else with it. I'm going to do something I've never done. And you can imagine that when he took Jesus to his house, he had an outer gate and he would have had guards, but also there would have been beggars out there as they did at many rich people's house. And he would have taken Jesus right by, kicked the beggars out of the way to get Jesus through the gate and probably did that every day. But on this day, something new happened. And it's likely he would have gone out there and he would have started right there with them. Here you go. I'm done with this. I hope it can bless you. You know? And out of his heart, this overflow, this new generosity welled up in him. And he found something that he needed more than anything, which was peace and freedom and salvation. And you know what? Only Jesus can bring that. There's not a dollar in this world, not a material possession that can bring what Jesus can bring, right? That's the, that's the message here. That's the overarching message. And so the question for us is, do we get that? Do we have freedom? Do we find peace with all the things that are in our life, or, or do they just run us ragged? And so I thought this morning what we would do, and, and for those of you who are in host homes as a part of the Simplify study that we're in, this will be a little bit of a recap this morning, but I want to touch on these principles once again. It's the five beliefs about financial reconciliation that Bill Havels talks about in his Simplify book. So let's go through those real quick. Number one, a one belief that we really need to nail down in terms of our finances is this idea that all I have comes from God. That all I have comes from God. You may have worked hard and be really smart and have a big degree and all this kind of stuff and, and, and amassed some money in your life, but the thing that you have to understand is we have nothing except that God provides it. Right? He is the one who makes things happen in our life. Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who live in it. Everything is God's. Anything that we have is a gift from him and the call for us is to steward it well, right? But, but that principle is very important and that helps us realize money is not everything. Money cannot buy everything that we need. I read this this week. It was a whole thing about money isn't everything. It said it, it can buy a bed, but not sleep. It can buy a clock, but not time. It can buy you a book, but not knowledge. It can buy you a position, but not respect. It can buy you medicine, but not health. And it goes on in this big long list. And I was like, man, that's really so true. You know, the, the things that we really want, you can't, you can't purchase those things, you know? And the things that we really need come genuinely from God. He is the source. 
And the second thing is, I live joyfully, good, important word there, within God's provision for my life. I live joyfully within God's provision for my life. That means I don't spend more than I make. Have you heard of this concept? You know, (laughs) I don't spend more than I make. You know, we live in a culture that, you know, everybody's in debt, so what's the problem with debt? You know, and all this. And, and we end up spending more than we make. And, and you know, it's, it's hard. I know it. I get it. I, I, I am with you in that issue. I have a, a great love for gadgets. I really do. For gadgets in the areas of hunting, fishing, running, electronics. I mean, anyway, stop right there. But, like, if you get a new thing out there or something, like, I'm looking at it. So here's a little story of confession. So I was at Bass Pro Shops on Friday. That place is, is awesome and evil at the same time. I don't know how to describe it. But Satan uses it as his tool to get the preachers. I know it. So, so I'm in there, and I'm looking at headlamps. You know what I'm talking about? The flashlights, headlamp thing? All right, that's a gadget. That's an accessory. So I'm looking at them. Princeton Tech has this new one. It's got one that goes 40 hours, 160 lumens. Man, you press that button like five different times, you get 40 different things. You get low light and high light, middle light, red, blue, and green, and yellow, purple, plaid. You can get all kind of colors. I mean, it just shoots all kind of stuff out of that thing. And I'm like, and it's got a little camo strap? No deer's going to see that. Are you kidding me? Mine doesn't have a camo strap. I'm looking at it, and I'm like, i got to have this. It's way overpriced. Nobody's it's ridiculous. But I'm looking at it. I'm like, (laughs) I want this thing. But then I'm sitting there, and I'm kind of scanning all of them, and there's one over there. That's exactly the one I already have. I actually have two of them. Between the boys and I, I think we have six of these. Anyway, it's an Energizer one, much cheaper. And you know what? It works perfectly fine. It has a few less settings. It only has red. (laughs) But it's fine. Why am I trying to buy another one? What is wrong with me? Have you ever felt that way? What is wrong with me? I don't need this. And it's, it's a matter of our heart, isn't it? And so, you know, I put it back up and it went downstairs. And then I saw an Under Armour pullover and I was like, oh my gosh, look at this. Oh, it's fleece and green. And it's like, I got, I need another pullover. Anyway, so, so I run out of Bass Pro Shops. <laughs> Okay, I'll survive that. Now I can preach, okay, on Sunday without feeling guilty. All right, so there you go. Free, guilt-free today, didn't, didn't do that. Anyway, <clears throat> but you get it that we, we so often, and then we slap down that pa- piece of plastic out of our wallet. Whoosh, you know, it's like, man, we're good at it. You know, just throw it up there to the counter, and everybody's like, oh, yeah, it's good. Then you just keep loading it up, loading it up, loading it up. And then we have this thing called debt, and then we become the slave to debt. Now, I, I thought it'd be interesting to look at something together this morning. Have you ever seen the debt clock? online. All right, we got it right here. Let's throw it up here. We're going to feel really good about this right here. That is a live deal. Notice how things are changing up there. Yeah, that's actually what's happening. So right over here, I know everybody can't read this. That's the U.S. national debt, which is about $19 trillion with a T. Okay, so let me go down here. Right out here is total personal debt, $17 trillion. 13, mortgage debt. Student loan debt, ooh, student is a painful writer. One, one trillion total student loan debt, credit card debt, 939 billion personal debt per citizen, 53,871. And I'm really liking this. I want to do this every Sunday. But anyway, let's just stand here and look at it. Let's just look at it. How you feel? Feel good? Look at that. Oh, my gosh. It's not going to stop. It's not going to stop while we sit here and stare at it. We could put it down and put it back up, and it'd be amazing how much it had grown just in the time of, of this service right here. But there's a lot of debt going on in this world, right? Lots of people contributing to that debt. Lots of people living not in freedom, but slave to the lender. And that's a tough place to be, and, and we do it as a whole group, you know. And anyway, I don't have to, I mean, you know, you're going, please, get off the debt subject. But So there's that. Um, in Simplify... Bill Hybel says this, and this is, this, this is going to get you right here. It got me. When you overspend to maintain an inflated artificial lifestyle, it's like telling God, hey, you blew it. You messed up my provision level. You got it wrong. I need more money. So I'm using debt to arrange a level of provision beyond what you are providing through my income. 
Yeah. That's a tough one right there. And, you know, it, it's, it's like God doesn't want us to live this way. It, it's not that he's a mean God who's up there like banging a hammer on us or something, but he's like, Gosh, just, I just don't want you to be stuck in something you don't have to be stuck in. All right, let's keep moving on. Number three, I honor God by giving the first tenth of my earnings for his purposes. And you know what? In a lot of ways, this whole idea of tithing and giving is an antidote to the disease of greed and selfishness. When we learn how to give money away and depend on less and really depend on God, it changes our heart over time. It really is one way that God can get a hold of us. And you know what? God doesn't need any more money, you know? He's got all he needs, so it's not about him needing more money. It's about us. It's about our change and our need for more of him and him trying to provide for us. So he gives us a way to do that through the tithe. Now, also practically, it's a way for us to invest in what he's doing here on this earth by helping grow the kingdom of God, by helping move the church forward. It's a way for us to be personally invested in that. It's kind of like, you know that phrase, skin in the game? You ever heard about that? There's a legend or like a story that actually comes behind that phrase that back in the 1960s, Warren Buffett um, was inviting six doctors to, uh, to invest in this venture they had going on. And so each of them were going to give $150,000. And, and they kind of sat there at the table and looked at Warren like, are, you, are we just providing this for you? Are you going to be in this? And so after a lot of conversation, he decided to put $100 in there just to prove that he was invested as well in what they were trying to do. And, and it was this phrase, skin in the game, that sort of came up during that process. He was saying, I'm going to make a sacrifice. I'm going to prove to you that I'm in this. I'm not just going to let you do it. And so that's kind of supposedly where we get this phrase, skin in the game. And in some way, when we tithe, it's kind of like we're saying, look, I'm not going to sit here in the church and allow everybody else to do this. You know, while well, I benefit from, from all that's going on in the church. But I want to be a part of the whole movement together. I'm going to put some skin in the game. I'm going to tithe. I'm going to make a sacrifice on my behalf to make sure I'm a part of the movement of God in this world in this way. And, and it's, it's, a, it's just this way that we get to tangibly show God our heart and what we feel and how we feel about him and to trust in him. In Malachi 3.10, it says, Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be enough room to store it. And what he's saying there is, look, just, just test me. Just try it. And, and the things that you really need, not necessarily more money and more stuff that's going to come into your life, but more peace, more happiness, more joy, more of the things you really want internally that makes your life great. That's what I'm going to provide for you. But test me in this, he says. Give it a try. See what happens, you know. And, uh, and he gives us his number 10, and people want to get hung up on 10, and 10 is a biblical number. I get that. Becky and I have believed in the tithe all of our marriage. But there's something about that. Like if you can't get to 10, start at 1. You know, start at 2%. Start somewhere and then see what God does through your giving. And I guarantee you by the time you get to 10, you'll be like, it doesn't matter what number I give. God keeps providing. He keeps taking care of me. And you're going to find a new level of generosity because generosity is really what he wants. He wants us to be generous like him. All right, number four, I save a portion of my earnings. Saving is a matter of stewardship. Saving is a matter of stewardship. I always talk about this principle. 10, 10, 80, tithe 10%, save 10%, live on 80%. Such a simple, I need simple. So that's very simple. You know, make sure I'm, I'm tithing, save 10. Now the saving 10 is important, obviously, because it provides in times like emergencies, you know, when all of a sudden we're like, oh my gosh, you know, car died, uh, medical bill came through, whatever, and we can deal with that and instead of having to go back to be sort of a slave to the lender. And, and also, though, there's a word that we talked about last week that when we save, when we have this extra money over here, it puts margin back in our life. It puts margin in our life so that we can handle things that come up unexpectedly. In the Bible, in Proverbs 6, uh, he talks about this in kind of a funny way. He says, go to the ant, you sluggard. And the Bible's not afraid just to call you out. You know, it's just like, you sluggard? Consider its ways and be wise. It has no commander, no overseer or ruler, yet it stores its provisions in summer and it gathers its food at harvest. The ant is wise. It doesn't have to do this, but it knows it's better if it saves this up for later. Saving creates margin and allows us not to get jammed up in our finances and is important, reduces the anxiety, gives us room to breathe. Okay, and then this last principle. 
I live each day eager to respond to God's call regarding my resources. I live each day eager to respond to God's call regarding my resources. And that margin allows us to be able to do that. So you know what, God, whatever comes today, if it has to do with my resources, I'm ready for it. And and I'm ready to invest in whatever I need to do. And I just want to pause right here. I want to give kind of a, just a personal thank you because um, to all of you and uh, to our church and what we did this last year financially, uh, y'all did good. You, you did great. I mean, we're in a better position financially this year than we've been in a couple of years. And um, I just really want to say thank you because I feel like this was a year that you responded well to God's call. I felt like you were eager and that, uh, that you were ready and that you did that this year. And, and it's been such a blessing. And you know what? The church needs to do all these things as well. <laughs> we need margin. You know, we need all of this so that we can be ready to respond to God's call. And you know what? The giving here, by the way, it is to keep the lights on and to keep the band so you can hear them. And it's to keep, you know, the air or air or how about heat? Keep the heat on. It's a good thing on a day like that. But it's so much more than that. It's like the investment that we make It is raising up the next generation for Christ, the next generation who will take this movement on beyond us, the children and youth and college students. And and I love that investment so much because, you know, I'm like, one day I'm not going to be here, but they're going to be here and they're going to be doing this. And we need to invest in that. And it's helping us do great work in a place like Uganda and to partner with people here locally. Like it matters to the vision, right? It matters to the vision. So anyway, thanks a lot. Good job. Okay, so ultimately, if I could boil all of this down, just getting back to what Zacchaeus found in that moment when he gave his heart to Jesus and everything else followed, peace and freedom. Peace and freedom. That's what he wants for you and me. And so to do that, we just say, God, I lay down my life. I I lay it all down. I give you just who I am right now. And I was, this song just came to my mind that sometimes these old hymns creep into my mind and and just as I am, you sing that hymn maybe growing up, maybe you sang that at church. Um, those words are so good and so rich and, and sort, of a, sort of a heartfelt plea to God. And so I thought I'd just read those as, as like a, a way that we commit to the Lord. It says, just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bids me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, poor, wretched, blind, sight, riches, healing of the mind, Yes, all I need in thee to find, O Lamb of God, I come. All I need is in you, Jesus. Let's pray. Father, this morning, first of all, we are so grateful that you are a God who provides and that we recognize that everything comes from you. Everything that we have is a result of your goodness to us. And so, God, I pray that we would all challenge ourselves to see that in what we have. And because of knowing that you have provided, that we would steward it well. That we would be careful with our money and our resources. And that we would line everything up around Jesus. And, Father, we're so thankful for... um, Zacchaeus and, and what happened there because it's, it's such a way to tell us about your love for us, your care for us, and that Jesus is the one who brings salvation. He's the one who brings what we need, and, and he can free us up from being a slave to our money and to the stuff in this world. And Lord, we know that that's why Jesus died on that cross, so that we could know freedom. So Lord, today, I'm just imagining in a group this size, there are folks who came here who were burdened, um, struggling in their finances in one direction or another and not sure where to go. And and God, today, I, I just pray that maybe even in this moment, they would just lay it down. That they would just lay it down and say, God, I'm done with this burden. I can't do it anymore. Would you please help me? And that in this moment, God, they would just simply say, God, you first. Starting right now, you first. And then, God, you would do what only you can do, which is come alongside us by your spirit. First of all, encourage us, strengthen, and then show us the way out. Help us to to be courageous enough to take those hard next steps that we need to take.
to find the freedom and peace that you want to give us. So God, I pray for that, for those who are here today who are struggling in that way. Lord, I know not everybody struggles in this. They're, they've done well with their finances. It's brought great joy to their life. And so God, I just pray that you would give them an even bigger vision for their life and their resources. And God, that we would all find our place in your kingdom as through our generosity we watch your kingdom passionate about making that happen. And God, we're so blessed here in this church. You've done such great things here. We want to see that continue in, in amazing ways as we take bigger steps into the future. God, guide us. Show us the way. Help us all just to be together and passionate about that vision. And, and so God, today, we just say that we love you. You are the King of kings and Lord of lords. You are the only thing that matters in life. And today we recognize more than ever, we need you. We can't do it alone. And this world will not provide. 